the Taylor family, the family, and just the, just was really privileged actually before COVID hit to go see them on the field and be part of uh, what was what was happening over there and got to see the field, got to meet these people, and um, just already um, seeing God just do a great work. Started another um, another Bible study, um, soon to be another church plant. And so he's just being fruitful there. And, and then also Brother Sorrow, just was remembering him that yesterday, just had a couple of conversations about Sri Lanka over at Good Shepherd. And just remembering Sorrow, and I know that, um, that you support him as well, so I appreciate that. He's a good young man. And, um, and we've been there, my wife and I went to Sri Lanka a couple of years ago just to um, make sure he got there, right? So he was um, we had just had missions conference that year three years ago and sent him during that time and then my wife and I decided we'll, we'll hop on the plane with him make sure he's not going anywhere else right so he went and we had a, a, just a great service over there got to see the country got to meet a lot of his co-laborers over there and it was just a real blessing to to get to know um, the, the field of Sri Lanka as well and you know, just mindful of the fact that God is the one that um, that is in charge of troop movements. So, remembering back to when we set them, the both the Portillos and uh, and Brother Soren, we just new people in our church. Um, particularly, I think for me, Soren, uh, I remember his first um, first Sunday in our church. He was a scrawny, puny, twelve-year-old that was in year eight. So. I don't know how that worked, but he was in year eight. And I remember him coming into my class. I was running this teen Sunday school class at that point. And I remember looking at him going, hey buddy, you're in the wrong class, all right? I thought he was, he was in primary school. And then when he explained he's in year eight and so forth, you know, I, I couldn't check for ID because I didn't have IDs, right? So I just said, okay, we'll sit here. And before long, I got to really get to know him. I would pick him up for a youth group. And, and really spent a lot of time with him and over the years just saw God working just marvelously in his life and then just a privilege to send him and you know having moved here one of the things I was mindful about is just just keeping relationships and you know I still pray very much still love our, our, our church in Sydney and, and we've kept in touch with our missionaries um, that we've, we've sent out and so they feel like anyway it was a bit of a shock for them you know, for us to move here, and, and to be honest, it was a shock for us too. We didn't know what God's plan was, but it's just important to follow God's will. And so this morning, I want to um, just have you turn your Bibles, please, to Psalm chapter 1, just the first psalm, and we're going to look at just some simple thoughts this morning. And, you know, in our world today, there's a, there's a great deal of um, anxiety, there's a great deal of, I think, unhappiness in the world. And you know, happiness is one of those things that we can, uh, it can be fleeting, it can come and go. And yet what we find is uh, that the Bible speaks about that. And the Bible uses the word blessed. And uh, I noticed that you had, as we walked in, had, like all good Baptist churches, have coffee. All right? And you had coffee set up out there. And, uh, we were on our way here. And, to be honest, I needed a, 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 a coffee beforehand, so we drove through, and the only thing we could find was Maccas. And there's always a risk. Some Maccas do good coffee, a lot of them don't. Right? And so we went and we drove past and we went through the drive through. And my first sip, I realized this was not one of those Maccas that had good coffee. All right? So uh, I don't know about you, but I, I know a lot of people who, when they have a bad cup of coffee, that just draw, just drains away every thought of happiness in their lives. All right? But I'm glad that I got a top up as we came in, and uh, probably you'll be glad that I had a cup of coffee as well. There was a time where my wife knew that I was a little too uh, dependent on coffee, I guess, and she said, hey, why don't you do a month without coffee? And I said, look, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. I can do that. She challenged me. I thought, well, you know, just to prove to you that I'm not addicted, I will do that. So I went off coffee for a month, and after that month, she said, "Please go back on coffee." And I said, "Please." <laughs> so uh, that one month was enough, 
And, um, you know, sometimes it's based on that. You know, you ever, you ever gone to your favorite cafe in the morning? And, um, you know, you, you order your, your coffee, coffee, your whatever way you want. And they make it just the way you do. And you get to the line, and you get to the, to the point where you pick that cup of coffee up. And you're walking away, and someone bumps you, and it just spills out. Anyone, that's happened to me twice. I must just be, just must just be me. I must be an easy target. But you know, sometimes you, you finally get to that, and someone bumps your elbow, and it all spills out. And I think happiness some, is sometimes that way. Just when we think we got it, a circumstance happens that bumps all our happiness out of our cups. And I think everyone wants to be happy. I think in our lives we strive to remedy times when we feel sad or discomforted and we go about seeking things that we think will cause us happiness. Someone once said, happiness in this world, when it comes, comes incidentally. Make it the object of pursuit and it leads us a wild goose chase and is never attained. Follow some other object that very possibly we may find that we have caught happiness without dreaming of it. And you know, we observe though that God gives us clarity from, from His Word. He wants us to really choose. And I think happiness is a choice. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. And He gave to His nation of Israel really the point of choosing. You actually have a choice in the way you respond to the situation at hand. And by inference, there's a choice that we have each day to see blessing. Okay, we know this is indeed a choice, and it's not based upon the circumstances or the state of our lives. Uh, I think everyone knows Fanny Crosby, one of the greatest hymn writers of, of the modern era. She was blinded when she was six weeks old by a doctor who put an incorrect solution on her inflamed eyes. But her attitude grew strong as, she, as the years passed, leading to a lifetime of uplifting music of some, maybe even today we might sing, and certainly all around Australia. And one of her first poems expressed really remarkable wisdom for a child of only eight years old. She wrote this, Oh, what, ha what a happy child I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world, contented, I would be. Can you imagine that as an eight-year-old? I think I, I know my both my children who pass that age. Um, if you ask them if, if they could, if there was one sense that they would be willing to lose, they would not be willing to lose their sight. I think children have find joy in the things that they see, and yet here this this uh, this hymn writer, this child of eight, Patty Cosby. She could say those things. And we know that God has our best interest at heart. And we've got to recognize that it's His providential hand that allows different situations that we face in our lives. You know, I think we often equate blessings, and quite wrongly, to material possession or to some favorable outcome in our lives. And there's a great error there. Happiness is a choice, not a circumstance. And in Psalm chapter 1, we see here really gives us a description of, of a blessed man. And if this morning, if you want to be someone who's blessed, someone who can, can say and look and see that you have happiness, this is the descriptor. So let's read there, verse 1, just six verses. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Oh, why don't we go to the Lord and pray, and then we'll get into the, the rest of the message. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord God, for the, the time that we have here together. We do thank you, Lord, for, Lord, just this church and, and for your people here. We're thankful to God for the, just the opportunity that we have to assemble together today, Lord, to be edified in your word. I thank you, Lord God, that 
Well, there's a there's a, a gospel preaching church in this area that's so 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 much growing and Lord so much potential, Lord God. And I pray that you just would bless this church, bless Lord our time together, Lord, those who will be guests today in our main service. I pray that indeed, Lord, that you would help us then to understand your word this morning as we open it. And we pray and ask these things in Christ's most precious, holy, wonderful name. Amen. What we see about this psalm is it's often regarded as a preface psalm. Right? Having in it a notification of the contents of the entire book. It's the psalmist's desire in this to teach us the way to blessedness or to happiness. It teaches us to, to, it warns us of the sure destruction of sinners. And this then is the matter of the first psalm, which may be looked upon in some respects as a text upon which the whole of the psalms make up a divine sermon. So Spurgeon said that. So this is a, the, what we can say is a preface psalm. And, and you know, I, I don't know about you, but many times when I need to get a bit of realignment in my life as far as where I need to be with the Lord, I often would open the book of Psalms. And recently, just in my Bible reading, in my scheduled Bible reading, I've been going through the book of Psalms, and it just reminded me of all of the, the advice that God gives about being blessed, being happy. And, and what we find, there's a couple of, couple of comments here that God makes in regard to, uh, to the blessed man. And we're going to look at that uh, throughout this, this study this morning. And so I want you to see in verse 1, the, the, the first... The first advice given to, if you want to be the blessed man, if you want to be the kind of person that sees happiness in their lives, we see firstly that the blessed man chooses the right influences. Notice there in, in verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And those are day-to-day are -day things that we do. You know, we, we walk with people, we stand with people, we sit with people. Well, all of these actions are actually not just things that we can do solely ourselves, but these are things that we generally do with people. Right? But I, I, I enjoy going on a walk with my family some afternoons. And I enjoy sitting with, uh, with, uh, with many of my friends and we'll, we'll discuss things and we'll, we'll, we'll sit and have a cup of coffee and and talk about life, and talk about the Lord, and talk about circumstances. I, I enjoy standing around, you know, around the, uh, a, a, a meeting room, and standing and conversing. All these things are actually actions that has to do with relationship. And what he's saying here is, is blessed is the man that walks not with certain individuals, nor standeth with certain ones, nor sits. And, Really, he's speaking about influences in our lives. Those who we choose to walk with, stand with, and sit with are influential in our lives. Who or what influences you will greatly determine your disposition. You know, too often we allow the wrong influences in our lives to direct how we view our circumstances. We can sit with someone and, and perhaps you, you've really, really have woken up and you've, you've had a sense of that blessedness in your life, but very soon if you sit with the wrong person, they can turn things around in your mind and suddenly you're looking at it from a totally different viewpoint to the point where you're now miserable. To the point where now somehow they've robbed you of some of that happiness that you had. And you know the, the advertising is like that when you think about it. The, the goal of advertising is to make you think that you're unhappy. Unhappy if you don't have that thing or you're not like this. It's trying to influence you by selling you a thought. But you know, relationships are like that as well. But when you sit, when you walk, when you stand with certain people, then, and often their, their disposition can influence your disposition. In Jeremiah 17, 7, the Bible says, Blessed is a man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. That's why, you know, as we go in our, along our way, as we walk, as we stand, as we sit, we ought to have a mindfulness of who God is. And we ought to place our hope in Him. And, and we ought to avoid, then, these three influences. Notice it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. 
And, and walking has the idea of agreement. Like the Bible says in Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? And so walking has the idea of going the, the, the same way, going the same direction, right? You're not truly walking with someone if you're walking opposite ways. But if you choose to walk with someone, it's really a choice of agreement. And he's saying that, that to the first person to avoid it is the, those that are ungodly. To be ungodly simply means to be wicked, to be impious, to be neglecting the fear and worship of God or violating His commands. And it's, it's an understanding that there are those who in their lives, in their behaviors, they're ungodly. Right, look at Jude chapter 1 and the New Testament Jude. And look at verses 15 down to 19. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So he's saying that there's, there's going to be a, a judgment upon these. Notice how they're described, all of these ungodly who speak in their speeches. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And notice the advice that the Bible gives us, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts, these be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So there should be a contrast. But notice the descriptors of the ungodly. There are those who are murmurers, complainers. They are those who... They, they speak great swelling words, but they, they do it to take an advantage. It's to those who are flatterers, to get an advantage. And, and that's the description of the ungodly. You know, sometimes we have this idea of those who are ungodly who live lives of debauchery. And, you know, just this past week we were, um, we were at, 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 in the Gold Coast. We had a young adult retreat. And we were able to go there. Some of you, you know, young adults came and uh, were thankful for that. But you, you walk around in the afternoon and you start to see that you know this week it was also a week where a lot of year 12s have just graduated have come through and they're all just living a party life it's called schools and i felt for them because they don't have god a lot of them perhaps have never heard some probably did and rejected they can't help it that's how they they, they live and, and that's the picture that we have of the ungodly they're going and they're just following after, and certainly that is, but, but here the Bible is saying that there are also those who are murmurs. Those who are ungodly are, are following, walking after their own lust, they're complainers. Their, their mouths speak, and it's, it's also in regard to their speech, the way they view, the way they present life. And he's saying that, that, that you, you, can't, you, you, you can't look at that and agree. Okay, um, it's, it's very, we need to be mindful of walking with those who are just, just in their habit, in their behavior, complainers and murmurs. You know who they, they are? They're just ones who just can't help it, they have to find fault. Uh, someone said this, don't complain or, and talk about all your problems. 80% of people don't care. The other 20% will think you deserve it. And, you know, uh, a blessed man chooses not to listen to murmurs and complainers. Chooses not to walk with them. A blessed man considers the ungodly but does not take counsel from them. And so if you want to find happiness in your life, if you want to be blessed, then, then think about your, your influences. And the first one was that. Um, notice the, the next one, standing with sinners. Right? In Psalm 1-1, it 
standing in sinners. Standing has the idea of being comfortable in association. So you're not just walking, you're, you're now standing, you're, you're spending the time. Uh, a sinner is one that has voluntarily violated the divine law. You know, I think we understand that, it's the transgression of the law. But I, I believe this is speaking about those who are lost sinners. And someone said this, although a sinner himself, he is now a blood-washed sinner, quickened by the Holy Spirit, renewed in heart, standing by the rich grace of God in the congregation of the righteous, he dares not heard with the multitude that do evil. The blessed man doesn't come become seduced by the lifestyle of the lost world. He sees it for what it is. The blessed man doesn't measure himself by the world's standard of success. And that's what he was saying that he doesn't stand with sinners. He himself, he understands who he is in the sight of God, a sinner saved by grace, someone who has been, been uh, someone who, who God has, has seen in, in his heart that, that belief, and, and yet he looks and he goes, I can't stand with those. can't stand with those who are, are contrary to the, the kind of life that I have. And a blessed man doesn't measure himself by the world's standard of success. And it is, there's a bit of an alluring, you know, we were, again this week, we were on the, uh, we, we got the pet house and, you know, the funny thing was that, again, the, if you've ever been to the Q1 and the penthouse there, the, the amazing views and the, just the great facility that that is, in the living room itself, you get 50, 50 people, right? It's just, just a great, it's amazing, um, amazing view out there. But then, you know, the week before, we, we actually got offered the presidential suite. So here we go, we got the email and the presidential suite is three times the size of the penthouse. It's a whole floor. One wing of it has a pool. <laughs> and it, just in a one, one space there. So we thought about it and I said, hey, you know, uh, Danny Holowati is our, our young old leader. I said, hey, why don't you just put a bid in? I said, just put a bid in and we'll see what happens. I mean, mi minimum bid was $800 a night. So I told him, look, offer 200 and see what happens. And if it happens, we just know it's a law. If it doesn't, then we know it's a law too, right? So it didn't happen, just so you know. But we figured, you know, imagine being, imagine affording the presidential suite. You know, if we're not careful, we can look at some of these who have that money and who are lost and go, well, I wish we had what they had. And we, we can very quickly have our cup spilling over, instead of being filled with happiness, stand and go, I don't have that. You know, you stand around long enough with these who are like that, then you can sort of go, well, let's compare. And, and you've got to be careful. Right? You've got, you've got to remember who you are in Christ. And then the last one is this, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So sitting then has an idea of staying or belonging. Right? We're here this morning, we're sitting together. In a little while, after the, the message is preached, after the morning service, we're going to sit for a meal. Sitting is, a, is it has an idea of more belonging. You belong at the, you have a seat at the table is often something you say, which means you belong there. You're part of the club, right? And sitting has that idea. When he's saying, be mindful of this influence, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Okay, and the scornful is, is someone who's feeling or expressing contempt or derision. It's treating something like it's worthless, acting in defiance. And, and you know, um, the, the blessed man won't take counsel with someone who doesn't have a, an honor for God's word. Who, who you know, um, will, won't sit with those who will just, just have a dishonor or have a disregard for the word of God, for things of God. And the blessed man will take a stand against those who deride or despise the things of God. And so he's saying there that, that blessed is a man who chooses right influences. This, the next thing, really quickly, is the blessed man chooses to delight in God's glory. I know you know that. You know, we're here at Sunday school, it's, it's growth groups, and we're opening God's word. But the inference here is that while the blessed man doesn't take counsel from wrong, wrong influences, he does take counsel and delight in the Word of God. And, and it can't just be that you just don't take counsel, and you don't take fellowship, and you don't take 
it's got to be that, that something has to fill you. And this is the word of God. We know Joshua 1 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest deserve to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And the choice to delight in God's word is really a key to true blessing. And we see the frequency of delighting, firstly, to meditate day and night. It's not just a Sunday thing, it's not just whenever it's convenient. No, this brings about the thought of purposeful time and purposeful um, uh, setting aside of, of, of that time to be in God's Word. It's not a casual perusal rather than intended study. And we ought to be students of the book. We ought to be frequently delighted. There ought to be joy as you discover things in the Word of God. It's not just a dry book of black and white. No, it ought to be the, the way it is described, the living Word. It ought to be the fountain that, that fills your, your soul of the, of the, the, the need that you have, the thirsty, the frequency of the lighting, we see the firmness of the lighting. Because of that, you'll be a tree planted by the rivers of water. The Bible says, His leaf also shall not wither. It reminds me of Colossians 2 7, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. You know, I, I, I've never met. A Christian who had a, a true happiness in their heart who hasn't been planted in God's Word. Who hasn't delighted in it. Who, who hasn't just just casually just gone about and approached to know. I've seen those who in the most trying of circumstances have, have a great happiness and a great joy. Why? Because of the promises and the reality of the Word of God in their life. But then we see the fruit of the lighting. We see that it brings more fruit in his season. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You know, Paul said that to Timothy, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. You know, someone who chooses to delight in God's word will show for You are what you eat. Right? That's true physically. But it's very true spiritually. Fruit in your life will display what you have done with the Word of God. And so, just the question this morning, how's your delight? You now, the problems you're facing just a fruit of really a lack of delighting in God's Word. The blessed man chooses to prioritize, meditate, and apply God's Word. Then, really quickly, the blessed man, in the end, chooses to be in contrast to the lost. Because in verses 4 to 6, then he switches gears a little bit and emphasizes the ungodly are not so. He's saying the blessed man is this way. But he's saying the ungodly are not so. The blessed man will be different to the ungodly man. And we see there's three contrasts, three areas that we see here. They have a purpose to live for. So the blessed man has a purpose to live for. In verse 4, the ungodly are likened to chaff, which the wind driveth away. You ever seen, uh, if you've mowed grass, you ever seen, uh, seen on a windy day all of those bits of grass that just goes floating by, there's no direction, there's no aim, it just goes everywhere. That's what chaff is. If you've uh, ever been to some of the desert areas in the States, you have some, some tumbleweed. It's just, just roaming around. It's got, it's got no purpose, right, except to be annoying. It's just going around and been to some places where a tumbleweed is as big as a car and you just sort of randomly watch it go by your cafe. I don't know why I keep mentioning coffee this morning. But <laughs> you know, they have a purpose to live for. If you're, you ought to count yourself blessed because God has given us a purpose to live for. You know, the ungodly, it says in verse 5, notice that they'll not stand in the judgment. Or sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You know, the, the ungodly, they're, they're going to face judgment. But you know, the blessed, we're going to face judgment for rewards. One day, we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, what's in danger? Not our salvation. What's in danger is our rewards. But, you know, I'd rather that than to face judgment for our Then also, they have a God. 
the, godly, the, the blessed man has a God to guide their path. It says, Therefore the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. In a later psalm, Psalm 37, verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And we have a God who guides our path. Listen, um, all of us here, we all come to some sort of decision point that's very consequential to our lives. We made one this year, moving to Brisbane. Having lived in Sydney all of our lives, and not knowing really much about Brisbane, have, uh, apart from the times we visited here for different different conferences and so forth, it was a it was a risk. But you know, I'm glad that we have God who we can pray to. We can ask for clarity. We can go to the Word of God that will guide us. It's a lamp to our feet, a light into our path, but God, God is one who can light our path. And he's saying the blessed man knows that. And, and the, 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 the reality is, the sad thing is, God has made all these things available for our blessing or happiness. And yet so many times we choose to just go our own way. And no, no wonder then why sometimes Oftentimes, we, we have the happiness not out of us. Because in all reality, we're choosing to go our own way. You know, out of, out of perhaps ignorance, maybe perhaps out of just a, just a, a neglect of what we're supposed to be and who we're supposed to be involved. We, we live lives less blessed. When all reality, God has given us the very, the very, the very description of how to live a happy life. And so, I wonder today, what will you choose? And today, there's going to be some who come here, they're lost, they've never accepted Christ as their Savior, and they're going to be looking at our disposition. Are we, do we have true happiness? Because I'll tell you what the world's looking for. And what we know is this, we can't have true happiness without the recipe for happiness. And that's through the Word of God. That's through who Jesus is. And, you know, this morning, people are going to be looking for friends, perhaps, to sort of go, I want to be around friends who are happy. I want to be around friends who have joy and have a different perspective to life than the, the thing that the world is offering. And I want to tell you, as Christians, we have it. And I hope that you would just choose that way today. All right. Awesome. Awesome.